Okay, folks, on with the next bit. So this is questions 11 to 20 of paper one from November 2017. So on to bonding. Question 11, which of the following series shows increasing hydrogen bonding with water? Uh, we've got propane, we've got propanol, we've got propanol and propanoic acid. Well, if we consider the structures, propane is free carbons and all of them just got hydrogens attached. So that won't take part in hydrogen bonding at all. It can only do uh, London forces. If we then think propanal, well, propanal, we've got a C double bond O and an H. So it doesn't contain an OH bond, so it can't form, it can't set up hydrogen bonds itself. However, it does have lone pairs of electrons on this oxygen, which it could use to form hydrogen bonds with water. So. It can't initiate hydrogen bonding, but it can participate because the water supply in the OH bonds. Let's consider propanol. So propan if that's propanol, uh, propanol would be one, two, three, and then an OH on there. So now we've got an OH bond, plus we've got lone pairs on the oxygen, so this can form hydrogen bonds itself. It's also got lone pairs, which so a water could form a hydrogen bond to this, for example with its lone pair of electrons uh, and also this could then form hydrogen bonds to a water molecule so we've got more options uh, so propanol beats propanol which can only form hydrogen bonds to water this way and then the last one then we've got ethanoic acid so sorry propanoic acid one two three we've got a c double bond o and an oh uh, one two Now we've got the OH bonds, so we can form hydrogen bonds with water, like so, and it's also got lone pairs on this oxygen, which can also then form hydrogen bonds with water. And now we've got two oxygen atoms versus just one, so we'll be able to form more hydrogen bonds with uh, propanoic acid than we will with propanol. They've both got an OH bond, but propanoic acid's got two oxygens, uh, so that gives more possibilities. So our best answer is propane, no hydrogen bonds. Propanol, okay, it's got a lone pair on the oxygen. Propanol, it's got an OH bond. Propanoic acid, it's got an OH bond, plus it's got the lone pair on the extra oxygen. So I'll go with A as the most options. Number 12, what is the order of increase in polarity of the bonds in the following compounds? So the most polar bonds will have the biggest difference in electronegativity. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. So chalk and cheese is going to be carbon and fluorine. So we're looking for carbon and fluorine to be the most polar because there we've got a, distant, a difference of 1.4. So it could be this one or this one. Uh, it can't be these ones where the, it's shown as being the least polar. And then what about sort of putting them in next end? Well, this next one has got an NO bond. Well, that's a difference of 0 0.4, uh, whereas this one's got a CO bond. That's a difference of uh, 0 0.8. So this looks like the better one again there because the NO bond doesn't fit. So we're going to go with answer C. Okay. Again, you could check further along, but time is there. Sort of not necessarily our friend in the exam. We've already eliminated these ones based on uh, the second running because that's common anyway. You just kind of swap the other two around. Number 13, what is the hybridization uh, state and electron domain geometry around the circle carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen? Whenever you see double bonds, just think sp2. Okay, so sp2, sp2, single bond, sp3. Okay, and then the associated shapes, of course, with sp3 is tetrahedral, so that's tet. Then with these, it'll be trigonal planar, so trig and trig. Uh, so let's go going on, find the best match. So sp3 and tetrahedral, that's right. sp2 and trigonal planar, that's right. That's wrong, it's not sp and linear, that would be for a triple bond. Uh, sp2 and trigonal planar, also right, and again, that would be right as well. So A is the only right answer. Okay, so simple as that. Of course, bond angles then, 109.5, 120, 120. Okay, but bond angles aren't present. To discuss. 14, how many sigma and pi bonds are present in this molecule? It might be easier just to redraw it to the side as a k coulé structure. And then we can also include the hydrogens which are not shown on the benzene. Uh, we can show the triple bond to the uh, nitrogen and we can then show out the double bond to the oxygen, single bond and uh, single bond there. That makes it a lot easier to count now. So the sigma bonds, it's right, every bond is a, has a sigma bond. One, two, three, four, 
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I actually made it look quite cluttered. Uh, I could have easily lost uh, track along there, so maybe that wasn't the best approach, but I'm fairly confident with that 16 going in there. Number of pi bonds, well, okay, we've got, remember, every double bond uh, is a sigma plus a pi, so that's one, two, three, four so far, and then the triple bond counts as uh, two pi bonds, because it's a single plus two pi bonds, so four plus two, that would be six, okay, so triple bond is two pi bonds, and then three, four, five, six, so that would be C. Uh, 15, which statements are correct for ionic compounds? Lattice energy increases as ionic radii increase. Well, no, that will go in the opposite direction uh, because the bigger the ion is, the weaker the ionic bonds are. Uh, so a larger ion will have a, a weaker ionic bonds and therefore a, a smaller lattice energy. Within the same group, the melting points of salts tends to decrease as the radius of the cations increases. Uh, Yes, that's right. So as the ions get bigger, the ionic bonds become weaker, so the melting points would decrease. So I agree with that one. Solubility in water depends on the relative magnitude of the lattice energy compared to the hydration energy. Well, if you think about how we often calculate uh, the entropy of a solution, you'll have something along these lines. And let's say that it was exothermic, perhaps. What you'd have would be the lattice energy, where it goes from a solid, let's say, sodium chloride, uh, which is probably not the best example because it's slightly endothermic, but it'll, it'll fit you. Uh, and then that would be, of course, to get it to form gaseous ions. So those are gas, not aqueous. And then, of course, you then get your lattice, uh, your entropies of hydration, where you then start dissolving them. So first of all, let's say you dissolve the sodium ions to make them aqueous. The chloride's still a gas and then you'd have your entropy of hydration of your uh, chloride, for example. So then everything is in solution. Aqueous and... Aqueous there as well. So yeah, we do have to compare uh, the entropy of hydrations with the lattice energy, so I agree with that uh, last statement there as well. So this one seems to show it as exothermic, whereas I probably should have had it go in steps slightly, but never mind. Uh, so that's two and three only, so that would be C. So 15 will be C. Uh, 16, what is the standard entropy of formation in kilojoules per mole of IF? So this is where it's like one of those annoying questions, but it's actually one of the chemicals in here. We're not just trying to find this. Now remember, if there are entropies of formation, then the entropy of formation of the reaction equals the total entropy of formation of the products minus the total entropy of formation of the reactants. So we could do this via a bit of algebra. So what we've got here is, so okay, so minus 89 equals uh, the entropy of formation of the products. Now we need to find the entropy of formation of this, so we'll have to call this x for now, and then it'll be 2x because there's two of them. So IF5 is minus 840 and that's going to be plus 2x, and that would be the entropy of formation of the products, and then we've got to take away the entropy of formation of the reactants. So iodine, of course, the entropy of formation is zero because it's an element. It doesn't take any energy. It could go from I2 to I2. So it's just one IF7, so that's going to be minus, minus 941. Uh, so what does that come out to? So that comes to minus 89 equals minus 840 minus minus 941. So that's going to become plus uh, 941, so that's a difference between those of 101, so that's then going to be plus 101 uh, plus 2x. So then take this number over, that's going to change the sign to negative, so minus 101 equals 2x, so that is then uh, minus 190 equals 2x, so x is therefore minus 190 divided by 2 is minus 95. Okay, so it'll be that one there. Uh, you could have done a hair cycle approach as well. I'm not sure if that would have been any easier, particularly as students often find the hair cycles uh, a little tricky. So 17, the combustion of glucose is exothermic and occurs according to the following equation. Here it is. What is correct for this reaction? Uh, delta H, well, it says the reaction is exothermic, which it, it is. It's respiration, basically. Uh, so delta H is negative because it's exothermic. 
And then what about delta S, the change in entropy? Well, we've got six molecules of gas becoming 12 molecules of gas. So there's an increase in the amount of disorder or the entropy of the system. So delta S is positive. Okay? So is this a spontaneous or non-spontaneous uh, process? Well, if delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, then we've got a negative value minus a positive value, so it's only going to become even more negative, so delta G is always going to be negative in this case. Because you've got an exothermic reaction, there's an increase in the amount of disorder, it's going to be spontaneous at any temperature, because delta G will always be negative. Okay. So that's going to be A. And then, which equation represents the lattice enthalpy of magnesium sulphide? So, of course, that's the energy change when we'll have magnesium 2 plus ions, as gases and sulfide ions as gases will come together and form magnesium uh, sulfide as solid. Some people have the arrow going in the opposite direction. The easy way to tell is if it's going in this direction, you're bond forming, so that would be exothermic. If you're going in the opposite direction, it would be a positive value because you'd be bond breaking and that would be endothermic. So it is a bit of a uh, say sometimes they chop and change as to which direction the lattice entropy is actually shown. But what's the best match for this one then? Uh, so, okay, so they've got it going in more the opposite direction with the IB, where you've got the solid forming one mole, one mole of the solid uh, ionic compound breaking apart to form its gaseous ions. So it'll be this one there, okay? So Mg2 plus and sulfide 2 minus, because those are the actual charges on the ions. These are where they're taking it a bit of a step further and then going back towards a Bourne Harbor cycle where they've then, okay, taken away the second ionization energy and second electron affinity. Those are the ions we want because those are the ions in the lattice. Uh, number 19, the entropy change for the dissolution of ammonium nitrate is plus 26 kilojoules per mole, so that's endothermic because it's a positive value at 25 degrees C. Which statement about this reaction is correct? Well, these are wrong because it's not exothermic, it's endothermic because the temperature uh, would decrease because our entropy change is plus 26, not minus 26. So it's this one or this one. And then the solubility decreases at higher temperature. Well, solids become more soluble at higher temperature. Okay, it's the, the hotter liquid is, the more material you can dissolve in it. So it's going to be the solubility increases at higher temperature as well. And then the diagram shows the energy profile for a catalyzed and uncatalyzed reaction, which represents the entropy change delta H and the activation energy Ea for the catalyzed reaction. So the catalyzed one. So here's our enthalpy changes. So this value here is going to be the enthalpy change, delta H. It's the difference between the two. Uh, endothermic in this case because the products are at a higher energy level. And then what's the activation energy? Well, the activation energy would be from here to here for the forward reaction. So it's not just X. It's going to be X plus Z. So delta H is Z. Activation energy is X plus Z. Uh, that's the one that we want there. Okay, this would be the activation energy for the reverse uncatalyzed reaction, and this would be the activation energy for the reverse catalyzed reaction. So that's going back again. But the activation energy going forwards is always from the level of the reactants to the uh, the top of the hill. Okay. So hopefully that's clear, and that's the next one done.